kind of resonate in your mind that you are not unknown, you are known. We sometimes think that we're unknown, but we are not unknown, we are known. We are known, as a matter of fact, when you were in your mother's womb, your parts were labeled and numbered. I think the first thing I did when Bobby was born was count his fingers and toes. I want to make sure he had everything he's supposed to have. I want to make sure that that God made, it, made everything right, 10 fingers, 10 toes. I want to make sure of the things that God has done because I'm human. I am sometimes in, in my own life feel unknown, but God says you are known. Our identity is in Christ. I want us to think about that. I, I'm from Chula Vista. I wasn't born in Chula Vista, but I'm from Chula Vista. I'm a Chula Vista boy. I'm known to be from Chula Vista. Let me tell you something, that doesn't engender a lot of applause in people. <laughs> Gary's from Nebraska. Sorry. No big <laughs> <laughs> you know, wherever it is that you're from, it doesn't matter because you are in Christ. Our identity is important. So important that we've, we spend a lot of time and money in our world trying to find ourselves. There are many tools that uh, we go through working in this process. Uh, you've probably seen the DISC uh, assessment, um, the NEO personality inventory, uh, the MMPI. Uh, maybe you've seen some of these other ones. Uh, you might have the Myers-Briggs uh, personality indicator. Uh, you might know that you're an IMSP or whatever it is. 
Uh, I think there's more slides there, Lon, if you could go. This is the disc. Uh, the next one, uh, this is one that we know, Strength Finder. These are ways in which we look at um, who we are, how we are uh, made, um, the numerous other personality tests and spiritual gift assessments. And we know that self-identity is important. And it is a developmental marker, by the way, in our adolescence. Uh, early adolescence is beginning to the process of identity. One of the, you know, I was a youth pastor for almost a quarter of a century. In that time, one of the things I recognized is there's a struggle between parents and youth. And the struggle isn't because you know, they're, one is right and one is wrong, although some of it can be traced to that. The difference is that these people that are teenagers are struggling to find out who they are apart from their parents. Identity formation begins at around sometimes 13, 14, 15 years old to where they begin to say, who am I? And they, their process is to differentiate from their parents. I don't want to be who my parents are, even though they might be great. I want to be who I am. And then there's a question, who am I? I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just being formed. And this is identity formation. If you have a child in that age group, it might be frustrating to hear that after weeks of being very passionate about one thing, all of a sudden they're passionate about another thing the next week and things change. Because again, uh, there's an inner stress, an inner turmoil deciding who I am. Uh, you might have remembered what you felt like at that age, trying to decide who you were. If my parents were Democrats and I was a Republican, when I was a teenager. Whatever my parents were, I was not gonna be that. <laughs> I had just made that decision. My friends, who were all smoking and drinking and cussing, said, Bobby, how come you don't smoke or drink or cuss? I said, because my parents do that. How cool can that be? <laughs> they cannot be that cool. You know, they, they can't be that cool to do that because my folks do it, you know? That was my mindset. Now, there were many things that my parents taught me. My dad didn't teach me a lot except for how to not do stuff. My mom taught me a lot about what to do and how to be a person. And there were some things that to her were immutable facts. It didn't matter what age you were. No matter what age you are, she goes, I don't care if you're a teenager. I will beat you if you are not kind, if you are not honest, if you are not good-mannered, if you do not talk to people um, correctly. You know, these are things that you do at any age and at every age. My mom was very clear about those things. There's a lot of things that I was looking for uh, in, in those years, and we all do. Uh, different music that I was looking for, different styles, uh, different social groups. I wanted to learn more and more about what it was I was going to become. There's also something that we have heard of called an identity crisis. You've heard of identity crisis, correct? Now, a lot of times, identity crisis doesn't just happen when we're young, but it happens sometimes at middle age. Am I getting a ring back? Do you guys hear a lot of ring back? No, is it just me? Okay. Uh, some of you may be experiencing some of that even now. A uh, middle age crisis basically is this. You reach a certain point in your life and you say, I've got less life to live than I just lived. I don't want to do this. I, I, I want to do something different. But the problem is, sometimes with middle age and midlife crises, is that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we think that, well, I need to do this differently. I need to have this different partner. I need to have this car. I need to change jobs. I need to move. I need to do all these things. And if I do those things, then I'm going to be better. These identity crises, by the way, are manufactured a lot by our culture and our society. And they're manufactured by the fact that we don't honor Christ in our life. I don't have an identity crisis. I never did. I didn't turn a certain age and decide, oh, I, I got to have a Corvette. You know, because, you know, I'd rather have four Volkswagens than a Corvette. But the bottom line is that I'm not really flustered by the things that the world has to offer me because I recognize that those things are fleeting. The type of person um, that you want to be, recognizing that identity is always important. Some people say, well, how do you identify? And it's different, interesting. I, I went into Tay's Burger Shack right here, took over Hardee's, right? So Scott and I, uh, oh, their first day we went over there. And I walk into this new restaurant that I don't know anybody in this restaurant. And they say, they ask me for my name and my order. And I say, Bob. And the lady behind me says, that's Pastor Bob. And I was like, oh, I know I've known this lady somehow, somewhere, I just don't know who she is, but, you know, she knew who I was. 
and let everybody know uh, who I was, <laughs> which I don't often mind. You know, I went, when I first started going to our gym, I didn't want anybody to know who I was because I wanted people to accept me, to get friends with me, because if you tell them you're a pastor, guess what? They don't really want to be friends with you or they act differently around you. Or if you tell them you're a psychologist, same thing. <laughs> you know, so you don't really have a lot of safe space there. So I just wanted to be Bob, you know, just wanted to be Bob. And so the second day I was there, I was running around the track and this one guy yells to me, hey, Reverend, how you doing? I'm like, okay, who, who calls me Reverend? You know, I don't know anybody calls me Reverend, but he knew I was a pastor and he let everybody know. And pretty soon, you know, it was known by everybody. And, and I'm good with that, by the way. I, mean, I don't try to hide that. I just like to get in a new situation. I like to kind of let people know that I'm a person too, not just a pastor. That when I get into the whirlpool, the, the water's not going to go up like that. And I'm going to walk right through. You know, I, I'm, I'm just real and personal. And you can talk to me. And you can talk to me about any issue and anything that you have. My friends down at the Volkswagen shop, a Christian, I've uh, been serving God for a long time, and sometimes he cusses a little bit. Um, uh, but he's 25, 27 years sober right now, doing really good. But the other guys in the shop cuss like you can't believe. Even when I bring my gran grandkids around, Jess says, Papa, Junior said 32 cuss words in like <laughs> one minute. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know, honey, I'm sorry. I'm like, That's okay, Papa, you know. Um, he just gets to tell you everything that he feels, you know, and, and he gets to be himself around you. And I like that. But I don't have any kind of identity crisis. I know who I am. And more importantly, I know whose I am. And it's not the son of, of Beverly Joanne Cave. I'm the son of the living God, the son of the most high God, that I know who I am. I don't fear the things that other people fear. I don't walk in the world the way other people walk. I recognize that God is my source. Amen? Amen. And I love the fact that I know who I am. Where we often point to certain personality traits or interests as markers of identity, Paul points to something completely different. And Paul calls it something different than even what I pointed to. Paul calls believers to remember their baptism. How about that? How many of you remember your baptism? I was 16 years old. We went down to J Street Marina in Chula Vista. All of my friends were there, hanging out on the rocks, fishing, throwing things into the water, whatever they were doing. We had a baptism service. Somehow the word got out. I'm going into the water. All my friends are jeering and cheering. You know, I'm getting you know, baptized. Hey, Bobby, what are you doing? Where's your board? <laughs> you know, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> who's that old guy? You know, what, what, what's happening here? Why is everybody dressed like, I mean, just yelling. It's just like in church, if they were here, they'd be yelling the same thing. Hey, Bobby, what are you doing up there? <laughs> but it was really one of those crazy things because what my pastor said was that this is my favorite baptism I've ever done. I said, why? He said, because you have all your friends here and you're telling them that you are dying to your sins and you're coming up new. So one of the guys said, what are you doing? I go, I'm dying to my sins. In a minute, I'm going to come up new. Shut up. <laughs> Let my pastor talk, you know. <laughs> and it was, I mean, I remember my baptism. I remember being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us that. He calls believers to remember their baptism. He proclaims that this initiating sacrament of the body of Christ, this act of grace, is being identified as people who belong to Jesus. In fact, it's the core identity of all of us who belong to Jesus. Do you know in other parts of the world, you can maybe say a sinner's prayer, but if you get baptized, you might be killed. Because baptism is when that seals in, in people's minds around the world your faith in Jesus Christ. It's a proper reminder for us in this season of Lent because at the core of the work of Lent is a reminder or the remembering of our identity. Stripping away sin. Stripping away distraction. Stripping away excess. And once again, find our identity in Christ. As Felicia said this morning, remembering 
not forgetting, repenting, coming back. These are the themes of Lent. This being the third Sunday of Lent, this is a, in the, in the, right in the middle of it, in the darkness of Lent. In that dark time of, of this heaviness that comes sometimes on us of remembering these things, we have our identity solidified in him. So I'm going to read some scripture to you. I'm going to read one scripture to you two times. I'm going to read it in NIV. I'm going to read it in the message. NIV is in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, verse 14 through 14. Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a, a new life. If we have been united with him uh, like, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, uh, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Aren't you free? Aren't you glad? Oh, it's wonderful. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Jesus Christ, or in God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace." I love Romans chapter 6. I love it. It is my Magna Carta. It is my freedom. It is my ability to recognize and say to the evil one, get away from me, you chump. You don't own me. You got no power over me, no mastery over me. I've moved from death unto life. Now let me read it in the message. I want to read it in the message because I like the way it says it. Now, don't get me wrong, the message is not a translation. There's lots of talk about that. The message is race. It's a person named Eugene Peterson who knows Greek and Hebrew and translated in his own life what he feels the Bible is saying in words closer to the Greek. Some people say, well, you know, King James is what I like. I'm glad you like it. You grew up with that? Go for it. I love the NIV. Well, great. You know, there's a bunch of words they left out of the NIV. It's less than, there's less words in the NIV than it was in King James. So, oh, no, they took away from words. No, they didn't. Translations or translations were always improving in language. Uh, when we're, we're talking about a paraphrase, we're talking about something that somebody has taken and tried to break it down so we can understand it easily. I appreciate that. I like that. I love the way Romans 6 reads in the message. Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? Talking about our sin. <laughs> we packed up and left there for good. All my bags are packed. I'm ready to go. I'm standing. I'm, I love that song. And it gives new meaning when I read it through this. My bags are packed, people. I can't repack. I'm packed. Those things are done and gone. This is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. But when we came up out of the water, we entered into a new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When you are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. When you are raised up out of the water, it's like a resurrection of Jesus. Each of us raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to the sin-miserable life. No longer it sends every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. <clears throat> when Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. 
God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang out, you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with this old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember that you are raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You are living in the freedom of God. Wow, that's amazing. That is freeing to you, Pentecostal church. I don't care what kind of virus is. You better say amen to that. This is your freedom. This is you saying yes to God and no to sin. This is you knowing, not thinking or feeling, but knowing that you have the ability to say no to sin. You are no longer chained to it. The chains are broken. Cut it off. Let it go. Leave it alone. Stop letting it come up from behind you and biting you in the backside. Leave it alone. God gives you power to do that. I love that. I love that. I want you to love that. I want you to be excited about that. I'm a part of a Pentecostal church because we're allowed to get excited about the scriptures that we read. I'm a part of a Pentecostal church because I believe that the Holy Spirit of God is still working strong in my life and yours. Amen. That he gives me direction. He gives me places where I need to stay away from. And he says, hey, by the way, Bob, this was bad then. It's bad now. Amen. Stay away from it. Leave it alone. Walk away from those things that bother you, that are hard for you. And stay away from that. It's just as easy as to tell my kids who would come to me all the time saying, every time I go to the beach, I lust. And I say, stop going to the beach. Go to the bowling alley. They wear big long shirts <laughs> with their names on it, Marge and Vic and, you know, Henry. And, you know, you're not going to have those problems. I mean, I know when I have a problem where I need to stay away from. You know, there are authors that I love to read, but you know what? When I started reading them after a while, it started getting into my mind and things that I didn't want to get into my mind. So I stopped reading those authors. There's directors that I like, but they went from good to bad, and I don't want to watch it. There are things in my life that I say no to every single day because I know that I have a problem if I indulge. Anybody with me? Anybody here have a problem? Anybody here walk away from stuff? You know, I've heard, you've heard me say I don't like the negativity. I don't like negative people. I don't like things that are always negative. I don't like that because if I'm around them too long, guess what I can become? Negative. negative and ugly. I don't like that. I don't want that because I have a new life in him. My Bible tells me so. It's right there in black and white. It's on the screen, people. We don't have to deal with it anymore. I love that. Walk away. We play basketball on the church league or baseball in the church league. And Bob Ross was our coach. And people get real competitive. You know who you are. No. People get real competitive. They forget that they're a Christian. And Bob says, hey, don't miss a rapture for a ball game. Let's go. Amen. You know. I'm like, well, then, Bob, put that guy down. <laughs> why, are you, why are you beating that guy up? <laughs> no, Bob was a good coach, kept reminding us, hey, this is not the most important thing in the world. What's most important is your relationship with Christ. Amen. Put him first. That's exactly the way I want to be. That's what I want to hear from, from my spirit and the spirit of God that is in me, that tells me and guides me and leads me. We would not need the word that we heard this morning from Felicia if we listened to the spirit and the power of God in our lives every single day. Because we would not be far from something. We would not be forgetting something. We would be remembering and putting those things into practice. I'll be honest with you, folks. This coronavirus thing is crazy. It is just crazy. Amen. I mean, it is, it, it, it's one of those things where you go, wait a minute, we were supposed to be in March Madness, not March Sadness. We're supposed to be watching something and we're not able to watch it. Sandra grieves when she can't watch football. There's nothing on Sports Center. I haven't seen Sports Center for four or five days. Not because I ever watch it, I never watch it. She always watches it. When it's on, she's watching it. I said, can we go to another channel? We saw this cycle already. 
They've already gone through this. Let's, can I watch something that I like? The grieving, oh, this is crazy stuff. But you know, when our world gives up money, there's something we should pay attention to. They don't give up money for nothing. I mean, this is our, we're driven by it. We are driven by it. But I tell you what, it puts focus on something, doesn't it? It puts focus on life and living. It puts focus on our family. It brings focus to, you know, being cautious and being okay, especially to our grandparents, you know, to old people. It's like being really kind to old people because they're susceptible more than other people. I got a double whammy. I'm old and I got diabetes. But I wanted, want you to know that when you see all these things in the world happening, the Bible says this, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. <clears throat> we know that in the last days, read Matthew 24. It's like opening your newspaper. There'll be pestilences and all kinds of stuff. There'll be all kinds of stuff coming around. Uh, and we know that things are going to go from bad to worse. Things don't get better and then Jesus comes. Matthew 24 says things go to pot and then Jesus comes. So think about it and recognize it and, and allow yourselves to, to not stand in that fear place, but stand in the gap with God. And says, I, I am going forward. I'm going to be cautious. I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to do. I, I mean, I'm washing my hands like a fiend. I mean, so we went to, to dinner last night after Sandra and I were here. For, she was here about an hour before I was washing everything down. And, and she looked at her hands and they're like all cracky and red from all the alcohol that uh, she was drinking. I mean, wiping. <clears throat> her hands were messed up from all the alcohol and all the wipe stuff and look <laughs> like all cracked up and need to get some lotion in there, you know, and, and, and soothe that healing. Um, so we're doing all the things that we know we can do, but we're also going to honor God in our living. And we and the, the world needs us today, folks. Do you know that in Antioch, um, there were a group of people uh, and the whole town said that there were because in Antioch, they, they had a problem with uh, sewage. They had a problem with taking care of people, and people were getting sick. And the only people that were caring for the sick were the Christians. And this whole Antioch knew, the only thing that they knew was that these Christians are real. And that Christianity is real because they are helping the poor and the sick. They are doing something that nobody else would even do. They were the ones, and they got notoriety because they were being the church. They were being the church. Shawnee Mission, St. Luke's, St. Joseph's. These all have saints in them, don't they? Children's Mercy. These all have, these were, these were church institutions, people. It's the church that made the hospitals. That's what, that's what all of our hospitals in our region are all about. And in our nation, we made universities. We did. Not the liberal people. Christians made, li made universities like Harvard. You know, they made these so they could teach pastors and a second generation of pastors how to be pastors because the pastors were getting old and we needed new pastors. So they, they built these schools, these Ivy League schools that we know of as very liberal institutions. They were designed to, pre to teach people how to preach and be pastors. And the hospitals were made by the churches. And that's what they were doing. Because the people of God are known to be people who will reach out and help no matter what. We will go where other people won't go. We got missionaries in lands that are very dangerous. Why? Because they're spreading the gospel. Not because they, you know, they're too old to ride a skateboard anymore. They like extreme sports. They're not missionaries because they're extreme sports fanatics. They're missionaries because they're extreme Christian followers. Amen. They remember their baptism. I want to show you a clip from a spiritual movie called Ice Age 2, The Meltdown. <clears throat> I want you to meet Ellie. She's a mammoth, and she thinks she's a possum. Now, Manny, the other mammoth, has been searching for other mammoths. He thinks he's the only one left, but then he finds Ellie. So excited. But he begins to realize that her identity is a little out of whack. So I got two clips here of, of uh, this I want to show you. One is uh, of... Manny meeting Ellie, and the other one is Ellie remembering that, why she thinks she's a pop.
Can you imagine all that Ellie has gone through trying to live out her life as a, in a false identity? In the story of the movie, everyone is fleeing because of a cataclysmic event. She joins with Manny on this journey, and it's hard as, she, as they can. She, he tries to convince her that uh, she's a mammoth, but he can't. But somehow all that triggers this memory that you just saw. And she remembers that a baby, she was orphaned and raised by possums. It all begins to come into focus, and then she starts living as a mammoth. But it's not easy living the new life. But the only way for her to find love, especially the kind of big hairy mammoth love that she wants, is for her to uh, drop the old identity and embrace the new identity. Where did you get your identity? Did you know that your identity is formed pretty early? We're going to talk about that next week as we get into this a little bit more. When we think about what it is that God has called us to and this identity of who we are. I think a lot of times, and I'm closing, but a lot of times I think we, we live in this world and we think that we are possums when really we're mammoths. We think that we're subject to the things of this world. We think we're subject to the rules and regulations and all the things this world pro that provokes provokes us in and provides for us. We think that the world is the one who tells us what's cool, what's nice, what's hip, what's in, what's out, what's this, what's that, what's important, what's not. And God always maintains what's really important. And when we try to act like we're possums, when we're mammoths, we're going to be in trouble because our identity is not in those things. I watched my retirement drop this last couple of weeks just like you did. I mean... $28,000, boom, gone. But you look at it and you know that, do I hold my faith and trust in that? I didn't freak out. I didn't come home crying and going, oh, Sandra, guess what? I didn't do any, I just it was like, okay, well, yeah, that went down. You know, it's gone up lately, yeah. you know, but I don't put my faith in it going up either because I said, yeah, it's going up, yay. I didn't get all excited about it and jump around. It's like, but you know what? It's going to go down too. And I, I don't like that, but I put my faith and trust in God who knows exactly what's going to go on in my life. Amen. It doesn't relate to just those kind of things, but my kids are in Gulf Shores today. They're a long way away from me. And they brought my grandkids, which is a cruel joke. And they're down there. You know, I don't know what's happening there. I can't see that. I think the beach is a good place to be in a time like this as opposed to a crowded pool, you know, in a hotel somewhere in Manhattan or whatever. I, I like that. But they're traveling. They're going to, you know, restrooms that I have not approved. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's one of those things where you, you think about those kind of things, don't you? And, you? and you can worry or you can just let God have them. And I remember when they were dedicated to the Lord. Did I dedicate them to the Lord? Yes. Did I give them back to God? Yes. Well, when I give them to God, don't keep taking them back when you're worried. Don't keep taking them back when they're doing something that you don't like what they're doing. Trust in the Lord and know that God is going to be with them. They may not be just like you are, but they're following God in the best way that they can. And, and maybe they're not even following God, but you have a promise that God's going to keep coming to them. Let me finish with this because it was important to me to know that when I prayed for my brother Gordon, who was an alcoholic since he was in high school, when I prayed for my brother Gordon every day, I knew that every single day, this was God sharing this with me in person, personally one time, because I was praying for Gordon all the time, and I said, Lord, is this doing any good? He said, every time you pray, I put in Gordon's path that day some, a question he has to answer about me. I bring somebody into his life. I bring a comment. I remind him of scripture. And Gordy, even every day, was still reading his Bible. Every day, he was still reading his Bible. And God was speaking to him every day. So at the end of his life, when he was in a nursing home, and he wasn't drinking anymore because they couldn't find any alcohol, and he was sober, and I spent so much time with him because he was sober. I haven't seen him sober for years. And we talked and talked, and we talked about God, and his Bible was right there by his bedside. 
and he read it every day. Now, he wasn't the kind of Christian that I was, but he was following God in the best way he could. And especially near the end of his life, he was trusting in God. I, I, I love that. I take that as, as, as hope that my, my lost, lost brother is going to be with Jesus. And I hope and I hope and I hope. And I trust and I trust. And I don't leave sleep, lose sleep over because I trust in God. I don't want to lose sleep over anything that this world has to say in. When we were in Egypt, they said that every time they dug into the ground, they proved more and more that the Bible was right. And I absolutely believe that. I don't care what they find. They, they could dig into a ground and it's a tomb and it says, Jesus. There's his body. There's Jesus. Buried next to his wife and five kids. See, your Jesus did this. This is your Jesus. I would not lose faith in that. I would not put faith in that. I would put faith in God. It's not just what my Bible says. It's what rings true in my heart. Because you know what? Once I was lost, and then I was found. You can't fake that. You can't intellectualize that. I was lost going that way, and then I was found and started going that way. It wasn't an intellectual decision. I wasn't that smart. It wasn't that I ascended to a new spiritual level. No, I was lost and I was found. I was saved. I spoke in a new language I never heard of before. Didn't even know it existed. There it was. How do you deny that? I needed that. I needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit the day I got saved because I would just think I was making it up because I have a very, very active imagination. But I can't fake it. I can't pretend, nor would I spend my life sharing the gospel if it wasn't absolutely the most incredible experience that ever happened to me in my life. Since then... In the 64 years I've been living on this earth, nothing has even come close to the planet size thing that happened to me when I met Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. No mental ascension, no master's degree, no nothing brought me anywhere near what that moment did. That's my identity. That's who I am. You can't tell me I'm not. You can't tell me God isn't real. Go ahead and try. It doesn't matter. I know him. My identity is set in him. I am not confused. I wasn't confused when I was 16. 17, 18, these very vulnerable years. I was not confused. I was absolutely sure. And nothing has made me doubt it. From that day until today. Amen. And nothing will. Oh, Pastor Bob, you shouldn't say that. Oh, no. I will say that. I have said it to you since I have been here. That's a long time ago. Don't look at my watch, honey. I'm almost done. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I'm worried I've got to go. Not, there's nothing open. Though none go with me, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided, but it wasn't just a mental decision of mine. It was a recognition of something that happened to me that nothing comes close. Oh, I've been to concerts. I've seen Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr in concert. I've seen Bob Dylan in concert. These are childhood heroes of mine. These are people that I love. Can I tell you, I never had one thimbleful of an experience in a concert of people that I love and adored than I did when I met Jesus. They were good concerts. But guess what? <laughs> I don't remember much about them. I remember thinking they looked pretty old. But I remember thinking when I met Jesus that all the old stuff is gone, all the new stuff is here. 
I have a new life. I have new hope. Everything's great. Isn't it amazing? Bow your heads with me. Thanks for indulging me like you had a choice. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for everybody here who identifies with your baptism. Lord, I'm not excited about Josie and Samson leaving, going somewhere else, but here's what I know. They're your children. They're identified by your baptism. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. And wherever they go, they go with you and they go with us. They don't go by themselves. They can't get rid of us. They're a part of us for the rest of their lives. Their kids are a part of us for the rest of their lives. Whenever we see them on Facebook, when they're 17 and 18, and getting married and doing all the things that they're eventually going to do in their life, we're going to look at them, remember them, and love them and care for them because they're a part of the body of Christ. They're a part of us. And the same is true of everybody in this room. We are inextricably linked together for the rest of our lives because of our baptism, because of our faith in Jesus, and they are family, and we care about family. Some may be very frightened right now, and they are family. Some may be so full of faith, they don't want to even think about that, and we are family, and we are together, and we are close, and we love one another, and we will not despair. Lord, I thank you that you are above all things in our lives, our creator and the author and finisher of our faith. So I pray, Lord, a prayer of blessing over everybody today that as they go to their work tomorrow, some may not even have work. Some schools are canceled. It's spring break this week, Lord. I pray, God, that you would let us embrace you and your kingdom. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you are and all that you're going to do in our lives and in our country. We pray for our country right now. We pray for this virus, Lord, to be uh, nipped in the bud, Lord. And Lord, it's already gotten out of control in so many places. I pray, God, that in America, Lord, that the curve begins to flatten. And Lord, that we will see uh, things come back to normal. And Lord, that, but, but not an old normal, but a new normal, where we say every Sunday is a national day of prayer. Every Sunday is a day where we come and pray for our nation, which we do every day. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me give you a couple of quick announcements. Number one, um, Pastor Scott and Michelle had planned a day of activity with the kids at Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, we've, we've decided not to have that day. Um, most uh, pediatrician groups are saying not to have these kind of play dates right now, so we're going to honor that and not have that. We were going to have students who are going to be here this next weekend through Saturate with our district, but the district has canceled Saturate. Uh, the JBQ meet, which was going to meet next week, also has been canceled, so there's no JBQ for that. We are, at this point in time, still planning on having our Wednesday night service, um, and we're, we're still planning on doing that. Uh, if, you're, if, you are on if you're not on Facebook because of Lent, then talk to one of your friends and ask them to look at the Faith Chapel OP Facebook page, and we'll post things on there. But so far, we're planning on Wednesday night service. Uh, we're planning on, uh, we're planning right now on the extravaganza, but we don't know if we will continue if, uh, doing the extravaganza this year. We're going to have to wait and see how it's going. Um, extravaganza is an outreach with a lot of people that we don't know, um, which might be not something that the, that the state wants us to do or that's safe to do. We may or may not do it. There's a lot of, we definitely wouldn't do things like face painting, uh, you know, but there's a lot of touching, <laughs> uh, a lot of close contact in our extravaganza. So, you know, um, you know, we don't want, you know, I mean, Bennett was yesterday licked his sister. <laughs> Bennett's got the flu and he licked his sister. We don't want any licking going on, uh, you know. Um, but I tell you, I would let Bennett lick me too, the kid. I love that kid. <laughs> but understand that um, we, we, we're kind of facing some different things. And just like anything else, we'll go through it together and we'll try to keep each other informed. Um, but if you have any input, uh, please feel free to let us know. Uh, we, we appreciate that. Um, but let's stand together. we we'll close in prayer today. 
Thank you to our worship team that stepped up and, uh, and led us in worship today. It was wonderful. Uh, we appreciate that so much. They'll be here uh, leading us next week as well. Uh, if the Lord continues, uh, is tearing his coming, we'll see you next week and, and do all that. And also tonight at 6 o'clock, we're having a prayer time. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to come and pray, that's great. Um, we want you to, to be here. Uh, Chuck and Karen have talked to me for a few months now. We've been talking about a Sunday evening prayer time. Um, and it's not something that we have just did because of this, although doesn't it work out really nice uh, to have a time of prayer on the National Day of Prayer that has been declared? Um, and we can come and just pray together. It's going to be one hour, uh, and, and that's it. Um, and that's probably as much as you'll pray uh, in a week, so that's great. I love it. Father, thank you for all that you do in our lives. And we know we kid, we just know, God, that uh, you are here with us and that I would love to, uh, to spend time with everyone praying tonight, Lord, just praying for our nation, praying for the people that are sick, praying for people, Lord, who are in fear, praying for people who, Lord Jesus, just need a touch in their lives from you that need to remember that uh, they're not possums, they're mammoths, that they were made and created to, to be who God made them to be, not who the world says they are. So be with us. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.